thank you for joining us this evening. Before I get started, please note that there is closed captioning and it's at the bottom of your screen. So I'll give you a moment to access the closed captioning for those who would like to access that. Hello again, welcome and thank you for joining us from wherever you are within our global community. I am Dr. Lisa Coleman, I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at NYU, and I use she and her pronouns. Thanks for joining us. As a reminder, uh, you can of course access closed captioning uh, at, again at any point during here. And uh, also I just wanna remind everyone we will be taking questions at the end. So please get your questions ready. I am thrilled to be welcoming you all to our second keynote event featuring Dr. Elizabeth Hinton. Welcome and thank you to Dr. Hinton for joining us tonight. Tonight's talk is part of our ongoing series entitled COVID-19 and its Afterlives, which includes lectures and conversations, as well as a collection of essays, all of which you can find on the program website. Please check out the Zoom chat for the web page link. Thank you to Melissa, and I wanna thank Jay, Melissa, J.M. DeLeon De at Skirball for hosting this series and for creating the fabulous webpage for it. Also, thank you to David Sugarman for organizing. This series is sponsored or co-sponsored by my office, uh, the NYU's Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation. And thank you to Dr. Autumn Rain and my entire team within the Office of Global Inclusion. Thank you also to Molly Rogers and the NYU Center for the Humanities, Verso Books. I'd like to thank Dan Chang and Jesse Kindig for their help in organizing. And I'd also like to, again, say a very big and special shout out to Dr. David Sugarman, the associate faculty member at NYU Gallatin for organizing these series. Thank you, David. Thank you for your partnership and the brilliance in bringing us all together. If you've not already done so, please see the featured essays offered on the series website, as I mentioned. And thank you, of course, to the writers, the archivists, and librarians who have ushered these pieces into existence. We're very appreciative. We are providing links to the writings essay, uh, featured in the essays and the sections on the website. And these essays include a series of letters written by Professor Crystal Beck, who teaches gender and sexuality studies at UC Riverside. Crystal writes very movingly about how the pandemic and how it intersects with queerness, migration, storytelling, and particularly in the work of Set Hernandez and the undocumented film, filmmakers collective. You will also find a piece titled Care During COVID-19. The author identifies as an Asian sex work, worker organizer with Red Canary Song. These two extraordinary pieces were commissioned by the APA Institute, and we are grateful <clears throat> to Amata uh, for her partnership and her leadership. Uh, Manjani. Also published on the site is a piece by Minju Bai, who is currently a postdoctor fellow at the Institute for the uh, Study of Global Racial Justice at Rutgers University. Dr. Bai's piece considers the life and work of the late uh, labor activist Robert uh, Takashi, who died during the pandemic. This piece was commissioned by the Ten Minute Library and the Wagner Lab, Lab excuse me, Wagner Labor Archives. And we are particularly grateful to Shannon O'Neill and Michael Konsiewicz for their partnership on this project. The fourth and final essay, The AIDS Epidemic and Its Afterlives, Frank Moore and the Labor of Activist Archiving, written by Marika Seifor, who is an assistant professor at the University of Washington. And in this, there's the consideration of the legacy of the archival work un undertaken and achieved by those activists during the AIDS pandemic. This piece was commissioned by the downtown collection at the Fales Library, and we are grateful to Nicholas Martin for the partnership both with the specific piece and the whole series more generally. Now we know these are, have continued to be challenging times, so we hope everyone is continuing to take very good care. This series is important to our understanding of the historical connections and those connections between the rapid global shifts, disruptions, and crucial, crucial opportunities for change. And of course, to address the very real things that are affecting all of our lives today. People keep saying that we've entered the new normal. It is not. 
I've been saying that actually the normal wasn't that great. What we need is a new different that recognizes the disparate impacts and their urgency. And instead of rhetoric moves toward transformational action for equity. Global communities are navigating many intersectional challenges, including increased stress, health reproductions that have come with the COVID-19 pandemic, processing violence on a global scale. Of course, we're all aware of the war in Ukraine or the continued and increasing violence against members of our Asian and Pacific Islander communities in New York and globally. And of course, the recent shootings in the Brooklyn subway and increased trends in violence towards so many other communities broadly. We continue to do the work here at NYU to address these issues and of course, to bring us together. This month, we are here celebrating Earth Month and we just completed NYU's Solidarity Week where we have renewed our dedication to taking informed action toward realizing sustainable global equity. As Nancy Frazier's keynote spotlighted, the global ecological crises and global pandemic cannot be separated from the global socio-political crises and their intertwined historical, ideological, political, and economic origins. I hope that we enter tonight's program in a learning and action-oriented stance, eager to deepen our understandings of the historic depths of these social crises and uprisings for social change, and that we also recognize the urgency of this historic opportunity to enact social transformation, again, rather than just going back to rubrics. And of course, Dr. Hinton is a wonderful, of course, person to bring this uh, to the fore for us. Before I finalize uh, and, and introduce uh, Dr. Dr. Hinton, let me just say, I want to also acknowledge the front and line and behind the scene workers who continue to work and whose labor is often unseen, those who continue to sacrifice for our well-being, including the people who clean up the hospitals, who drive and deliver, uh, those people who maintain our facilities, the public transportation, all those essential, deemed essential, and all those workers who are essential, who support us and care for us. We know we cannot be without you. I'd like to take a moment now to honor those who've come before us, our ancestors upon whose unseen labor many of our institutions are built, and the indigenous peoples whose lands we now occupy. We acknowledge that we are gathered here in these virtual spaces, but many of our institutions and campuses are located on the unceded lands of indigenous peoples. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, on whose land, including those that land on which the NYU campus is located. NYU acknowledges that the university as an institution created in the United States was founded on the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, as well as the discount, discounted labor of many. We continue to both recognize and dismantle these systemic and systematic exclusions. We would like to honor those whose lives have been lost, taken due to racism, sexism, xenophobia, and those other ongoing systemic forms of oppression and violence, those who are known to us and those who are unknown. Let us take 10 seconds of silence and recognition. Thank you. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor Elizabeth Hinton. Elizabeth Hinton is an associate professor in the Department of History and the Department of African American Studies at Yale with a secondary appointment as a professor of law at the law school. Hinton's research focuses on the persistence of poverty, racial inequality, and urban violence in the 20th century United States. She is considered one of the nation's leading experts on criminalization and policing. In her book, From War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America, Harvard University Press, Hinton examines the implementation of federal law enforcement programs beginning in the mid-1960s that transformed domestic social policies and laid the groundwork for the expansion of the present and current U.S. prison system. In revealing the links between the rise of the American carceral state and anti-poverty programs, Hinton excuse me, presents Ronald Reagan's war on drugs, not as a sharp policy debate, but rather as the full realization of the shift towards surveillance and confinement that began during the Johnson administration. Before joining the Yale faculty, Hinton was a professor in the Department of History and the Department of African American Studies at Harvard University. She spent two years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Michigan Society of Fellows and as an assistant professor in the Department of Afro-American and Afri African Studies at the University of Michigan. 
a Ford Foundation and Carnegie Corporation fellow. Hinton completed her PhD in the United States in the United States history from Columbia University in 2013. Hinton's articles and op-eds can be found in pages of the Journal of American History, Journal of American History, excuse me, the Journal of Urban History, the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Boston Review, The Nation, and Time. She has also co-edited co -edited the new Black History, Revisiting the Second Reconstruction, and that's Palgrave Macmillan with the late historian Manning Marable. Please join me on camera, Professor. Hinton, and let us all welcome you. Thank you for being with us tonight, and thank you for your amazing contributions to our to to our scholarly world. I turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman, for that introduction. It really means so much to me um, coming for you and also um, for being in dialogue with me this evening. I also like to thank David Sugarman for inviting me, um, NYU's Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, the Skirball Center, and all those um, institutions and individuals on campus that had their hand in this. Um, who help make this very important series possible. And then of course, all of you, um, to all of you for coming and joining in. Okay, I'm going to do the awkward Zoom thing where I share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see. Okay, so as um, Dr. Coleman said, the COVID-19 and its afterlife series has been considering how the pandemic exacerbated structures of inequality that have shaped American institutions historically. My work on the impact of COVID in prisons has led me to think of COVID as kind of a stress test for our society. All of the underlying fragilities of various systems and institutions in America masked under normal circumstances became apparent during COVID. <clears throat> For hospitals and the healthcare system, the COVID stress test exposed basic equipment shortages, the limits of health insurance to provide equitable care, and the nation's unacknowledged dependence on the labor of underpaid healthcare workers and the disproportionate effects of disease on poor people and people of color. Lockdown was a stress test for this nation's unequal distribution of resources and services. Everybody faced uncertainty and extremes hardship during COVID. Everyone's lives were upended, but the shockwave of lockdown was felt most acutely by poor people and people of color. Black adults were three times as likely as whites to face food insecurity, eviction, being laid off, or job loss. And COVID showed us just who is more vulnerable to premature death itself. We see the disproportionate impact of the virus most clearly in its death toll, the pandemic's most tragic and pronounced expression of the deadly virus of racism and its institutional manifestations. And this graph represents the death toll during the first four months of the pandemic, showing alarming mortality rates among Black, Indigenous, and Latinx groups. Due to a long history of systemic exclusion from housing options and living in neighborhoods the more likely to be exposed to pollutants and toxins, as well as access to adequate health care and employment opportunities, people of color were at greater risk of catching the deadly virus and at higher risk of severe disease and death. 70% of the people who died in the city of Chicago and 70% of the people who died in the state of Louisiana were Black. And Black, Indigenous, Pacific Islander, and Latinx people aged 45 to 54 are at least six times more likely to die from COVID than white people. So not only did COVID reveal these underlying fragilities grounded on the impact of centuries of economic exploitation and political repression, it also amplified the impact of structural racism. What happened inside the American prison system during the first year of the pandemic is a stark illustration of how COVID exacerbated systemic inequalities. The story of prisons during COVID illuminates not only the way racial discrimination shapes every element of the American criminal legal system, but also how that system ensnares people of color in general and black people in particular by default. We know as a result of a combination of structural inequities, and discriminatory enforcement, that people are, of color are more likely to be stopped by police, held in jail pretrial, pre charged with more serious crimes, and sentenced more harshly than white people. These practices have made Black American men six times as likely to be incarcerated as white men and Latino men 2.5 times as likely. For nearly a decade, however, the proportion of, of incarcerated Black people has been declining. 
in March 2013, roughly 39.9% of people incarcerated in state prisons were Black, and by March 2020, this number had fallen to 37.8%, a decline of 2.1% over seven years. White prison admissions grew at the same time, resulting in a narrowing of racial inequality in the prison system. But let us not be confused about this. Racial disparities in prison admissions are still severe and black people continue to be admitted to prison more than any other group, reflecting the ongoing legacies of racially oppressive practices and policies. But it's at least a step in the right direction that the black white disparity in prison admissions reached its lowest level in decades in 2015. But COVID changed all this. During the first year of the pandemic, the proportion of black people behind bars increased nearly 1%, erasing much of the progress from the de declines over the last decade. Essentially, COVID intensified existing racial inequalities in policing and incarceration. At the same time, the COVID era has been marked by growing social movements around the abolition of police and prisons. But even those of us working towards fundamental change don't talk enough about what's going on inside. And the problem of COVID in prisons has remained on the margins through discussions about the pandemic. Now in the United States, maintaining the largest and most expansive prison system in the world with severely overcrowded conditions poses a major public health threat. The congregate setting of a jail or prison breeds the spread of infectious disease and especially those that spread through droplets in poorly ventilated air like COVID. So people in prison lack the ability to take the necessary precautions to prevent the spread of the disease. Social distancing was off the table. Incarcerated people are required to share bathrooms, showers, eating areas, and other common spaces. Soap and other kinds of cleaning supplies are limited when they are provided if accessible at all. And PPE and masks are even still harder to come by. People in custody suffering from other illnesses had struggled to be seen by specialists and receive proper care before COVID. And imagine what this access looks like during COVID. Pre-existing weaknesses in prison healthcare systems made incarcerated people even more vulnerable to death during and by COVID. Many of the people in prison were locked up during the height of the war on drugs in the 80s and 90s, and because of mandatory minimum sentences, three strikes laws, and crimes related to marijuana and drugs that have since been decriminalized, um, they're there. Those who were arrested and convicted at young ages some 30 years ago are now much older. They no longer pose the threat to society that, that they did decades ago, and they are also, because of their age, more vulnerable to developing severe complications from COVID. As COVID began to run through prisons, administrators also did not take precautions to prevent continued spread. Listen to a letter my friend Colton, System, Colton Simpson wrote me, who was incarcerated at Cor Corcoran State, State Prison in uh, California in November 2020. He said, it's horrible here. One person died yesterday, and there are over 500 cases at this institution. On Friday, staff locked our room and told us we were being quarantined. Hours later, they returned and took one of my roommates out. There are eight inmates per room and told him he tested positive. They apparently transported him to isolation. They informed the remaining seven of us that we were being moved to quarantine. However, so many other inmates tested positive that staff inform us, informed us that the entire facility F was being placed on lockdown status, modified program, as there were more inmates housed on COVID than regular housing, and staff no longer had any beds available for quarantine. Since then, we've been locked in the room with our property packed and ready to be transported to quarantine, but no transfers have taken place. So as Colton tells it, the response of prison authorities to the outbreak was to punish everyone with the lockdown instead of helping people stay safe. Not surprisingly, it was only a matter of time before Colton got COVID since the conditions and practices at Corcoran and every other prison facilitated the rapid spread of the virus. Colton's JP email to me was a little glimpse into what's happening inside prisons in the age of COVID. As with all things prison, it's difficult to get accurate information. Prison authorities are known for their secrecy, their secrecy, not their transparency. When a group of people confined at the George F. Bailey Detention Center in San Diego contacted the San Diego Union Tri Tribune to try to bring awareness to the situation they were facing with COVID, with the COVID spread, the Sheriff's Department placed these incarcerated activists in isolation as punishment. This image, we don't deserve to die, that ran in the Tribune from the uh, Bailey Detention Center makes it plain. The harms of confinement and public health danger became acute.
The problem of COVID in prisons is not just a problem of prisons, of course. The unhealthy in all senses of the word attachment to incarceration in America not only diminishes the health and well being of people serving time, but also the staff who work there, the families they come home to, and the country as a whole. And we know that the most effective way to, pre to prevent those deaths and to mitigate outbreaks inside and outside of prisons is to decarcerate or de densify the carceral setting. Even more than housing each incarcerated person in a single cell or instituting broad-based testing, releasing people to allow those people remaining physical space to distance has the greatest potential to reduce COVID transmission in prison. For a moment in the early stages of the pandemic, it looked like the public health call to de-densify prisons would lead support for calls for, to calls for um, decarceration and abolition that have grown louder in the past decade. The slogans and hashtag free them all or free them all for public health and advocacy brought attention to the alarming situation COVID causes in prison and jails and helped widen support to reduce the nation's prison populations. Incarcerated people, meanwhile, filed hundreds of lawsuits seeking early re release from prison, many on the grounds that COVID itself turned a prison sentence into a death sentence, the same argument the incarcerated people at the George F. Bailey jail courageously made. At the same time, the nation witnessed the largest, fastest reduction in prison population in American history during the first year of the pandemic, when the number of incarcerated people in the United States decreased by at least 16.3% from approximately 1.2 million people to 1.3 million people. Regardless of whether a given state of, of, of a given state's pre-population trends, we see large reductions in prison populations in every state beginning in early to mid-April 2020. States like Massachusetts, California, and South Carolina entered 2020 with a steadily declining prison population and continued to support that decline through the pandemic. States like Alabama, Indiana, and Montana that had growing prison populations before the pandemic even began to shed prisoners when COVID hit. We also saw pop population declines in the federally run immigration detention system, although what happened in private prisons for migrants is still really unclear, um, where 70% of those who are barred from entry into the United States are held in these private prisons. And it's the immigration detention system and the criminal criminalization of immigrants or crimigration where the privatization of prisons is particularly egregious. In the winter of 2020, the government uh, held approximately 39,000 non-citizens for potential removal. By April of 2021, that number had been reduced by more than half down to 14,000. This is partly due to a decline in arrests by ICE, but mostly due to a dramatic drop in detaining migrants at the border. Using federal code, Border Patrol agents simply started expelling migrants, including asylum speakers, seekers, the people um, shown in this photo, at the nation's borders on public health grounds. So whether immigration detention or state or federal prison, these institutions advance racist and exclusionary policies in the COVID stress test. Last fall, I got together with a group of data scientists, epidemiologists, and public health experts to get to dig into the impact of this decarceration effort um, and what it looked like inside state prisons. Led by Northeastern data scientist Brendan Klein, we curated a large public data set across all 50 states in Washington, D.C. to offer a comprehensive view into the dynamics of prison populations before, during, and after the pandemic. And our working paper is available to the public online, but we're currently revising um, the work for a um, top science journal. So hopefully this paper will be published in the coming months. So this is kind of a sneak preview. And let me tell you, just building this data self itself was a major undertaking. Um, the Bureau of Justice Statistics data, which most researchers rely on, is only available in the pre-COVID era. And it's even more difficult to get sound data about the racial composition of the nation's prison system. This really prevents accurate measurements of racial disparities or the, me the mechanisms that underlie them, uh, underlie them because criminal legal institutions make it as difficult as possible to get a true and comprehensive picture um, of the racial dynamics that fuel the system, which makes it um, impossible to get a true and comprehensive picture of the problem and inform policies that can address it. So we worked as tirelessly as we could um, to mitigate this and kind of create a comprehensive picture. And in order to obtain this um, data from all 50 states, we had to file 
numerous Freedom of Information Act requests, and then man manually scrape data from various um, departments of corrections websites, actually to create code to download PDFs and then input that um, into our spreadsheets. Um, crazy process. But um, since the reporting is not uniform on these issues and it's pretty haphazard, our population data either reflects um, weekly, monthly, or quarterly uh, prison uh, population figures, um, and for some states on yearly levels. Most of the data that we use um, was at the monthly level. So we started by examining the racial composition of the historic decrease in the overall number of people incarcerated. Um, the prison population decline that I mentioned of approximately 200,000 individuals between March uh, 2020 and July 2021. And we found that the number of incarcerated people decreased dramatically in 2020, regardless of race, but that these declines were not distributed equally by race, especially for incarcerated Black people. Um, the relative increase in the amount of incarcerated Black people is seen in almost every state. So first, here's a graph um, for all 50 states. I know it's not the easiest to see, but the shaded line on each represents when COVID hit. Um, and we pretty much see, you know, initially massive drops across the board. And then here's the national picture again, but now compared uh, to the percent of Black prison populations. And nationally, again, we see the U.S. shed prisoners, but the proportion of Black prisoners um, began to increase um, almost immediately in March 2021. Um, here we break it down by the percentage of the Black incarcerated population across nine representative states. And so the distributions don't, aren't exactly the same, but they tell a similar story, right? And that's when COVID hit, the proportion of incarcerated Black people spiked. Um, if the racial disparities that we observed did not exist, we estimated that nearly 15,000 fewer Black people would have been incarcerated in January 2021. So 15,000 fewer um, incarcerated Black people. We can think about what that means not only for individuals, but also for families and entire communities. Now, the fact that Black people were being disproportionately incarcerated during COVID was not due on average to Black people committing and being sentenced for more severe offenses. So this is not um, a crime wave story. In fact, it's just the opposite. For example, in Texas, uh, during the first year of COVID, there was a relative increase not in violent crime against or convict uh, among, sorry, there was relative increase not in violent crime among convicted Black people, but in low and moderate offenses. So the increase um, if the increase in the Black po prison population wasn't due to Black people committing more crime and more serious crime, then what were the developments that led to this disturbing trend? So first, some states recognized the immediate need to decarcerate or de-densify and enacted policies and initiated, initiated executive orders to release individuals who met um, a certain set of criteria. So although these policies played a really small role in the nationwide pandemic prison population decline, they still carried a, the signature of racism that is the feature of the pandemic. So um, nearly all of the states that adopted or implemented decarceration measures adopted a set of restrictions for early release that systematically excluded incarcerated people of color due to discriminatory practices at the sentencing level and in the administration of prison. So across the board, most of those who were eligible for early release were those convicted of nonviolent crimes with less than a year to serve on their sentence. Um, getting COVID was actually not a release factor. So people serving time for murder or sex offenses were automatically ruled ineligible. Um, the group of nonviolent offenders then on the verge of release also had to meet um, a set of criteria that automatically put incarcerated people at a disadvantage. So to get out early in the age of COVID, you usually had to be in good medical condition. You had to have an improved address to return to. Return to. Um, you had to have few, if any, disciplinary infractions while in prison. And you had to be assessed at a medium to low risk of recidivism. So those with greater resources going in, those with better health going in, and those who were less likely to get punished while inside were also more likely to get an early COVID release. Um, in Virginia and other states, officials used the COMPASS 
risk assessment tool to determine an individual's likelihood of returning to prison. And we know that these algorithmic risk assessment tools are weaponized against low-income people of color and perpetuate systemic racism. Um, one study of Compass found that Black people were twice as likely to be labeled as a high risk for recidivism, but not actually reoffend. So um, in this slide, Compass and that had inaccurately determined that the white man in this photo was at a way lower risk of reoffending, even though he did go on um, to reoffend. So we see the impact of these release policies um, in Arkansas, particularly clearly. We have good data from there. Um, despite the fact that 57.2% of the Arkansas prison population was white. Over 72% of the incarcerated people eligible for early releases were white. And racial disparities in prosecution and sentencing practices explain the discrepancy. Um, Black defendants across a range of crimes were more likely to be convicted and given harsher sentences. On average, in the states that de-densified during early COVID, Black in, uh, incarcerated people were released at disproportionately low rates and incarcerated white people were released at disproportionately high rates as in Arkansas. Uh, with these decarceration policies, the racial injustices of the criminal legal system shaped public health outcomes. Because the racism is not only about who was released, but then who was left behind. Um, the increase in the proportion of incarcerated people of color translates to their, their heightened risk of exposure to COVID-19. But again, on the whole, COVID release programs didn't play a huge role in the historic reduction in US prison populations during the pandemic. Policing also played a role. Um, the, the second major development that led to this increase in the proportion of incarcerated people of color has to do with how policing and police interactions changed during the pandemic. So now we already know that low-income communities of color are policed far more heavily than their white counterparts that police are more likely to stop and frisk pedestrians and pull over and search black drivers, despite the fact that they have lower contraband hit rates. And black people are also more likely, black people and people of color are also more likely to be arrested. So traffic stop data that we have from Texas and California show that these practices skyrocketed during the pandemic. So black and Latinx people were coming into contact with police more frequently with the opposite being true for white people. So just look at this. Um, in Texas and California, white drivers um, spiked down um, and, and Black and Latinx drivers spiked up when the pandemic hit in terms of tra traffic stops. So this is like a really powerful graph because the white stops and the um, combined Black and Latino stops are um, mirror images of each other, right? And of course, traffic stops are not the only way for people to enter the, ju the judicial system, um, nor are they the primary source of prison admissions. But this data from Texas and California um, does reflect on how the pandemic shaped policing. And as the first step towards sending a person to prison, policing strategies can ultimately bring about changes in the racial distribution of the prison population. Uh, these traffic stops also reflect the way that neighborhood comp uh, composition and occupation deeply shaped COVID outcomes. Um, because the essential work, right, that is more, that was more likely to require in-person attendance was disproportionately held by people of color. Black and Latinx people were more likely to be driving during the period of high lockdown to get to work um, at a time that I imagine most of us on this Zoom call were working from home um, and therefore more likely to be pulled over and arrested. But the most probable cause of the large scale, large scale dis, uh, disparities that were observed during the pandemic era, era are disruptions in the court system. Um, this is the kind of initial closure at the juvenile court in Los Angeles. Lockdown policies that many institutions and non-essential businesses implemented beginning in March 2020 interrupted the everyday operation of the courts. Most courts halted their judicial proceedings at the height of lockdown and suspended and thereby suspended um, their trials and sentencing. Every state except, except Nebraska, in fact, um, closed at the beginning of the pandemic, which dramatically reduced or altogether stopped admissions into prisons for several months in the spring of 2020. Um, and these disruptions to the court system and court proceedings led to new racial inequities in the prison system 
and the increase in the proportion of incarcerated Black people. So we'll take Florida, for example. Um, I don't think the lessons I'm about to tell you are the ones that this graphic is referring to, but it works for our purposes, so we're going to go with it. So before COVID hit in March 2020, uh, the Florida court system had processed about 14,000 defendants month monthly. Um, this fell sharply beginning in March 2020, dropping by about two thirds um, down to 4,000 people. Between March and June 2020, so be from the beginning of the pandemic to the beginning of the Breonna Taylor and George Floyd protests, more than 99% of the cases in Florida did not go to trial at all, up from an average of approximately 97% prior to 2020. Um, so during COVID, either people were much more likely to plead guilty or to have their charges dropped, and either outcome disadvantages Black people. Uh, Black defendants are 70% more likely than white defendants to receive a plea deal that involves spending time in prison. Prosecutors, on the other hand, are more likely to drop a white defender's top charge or reduce their sentence than Black defendants. So Black people pleading on a misdemeanor are also more likely to be sentenced to incarceration than white people. In Wisconsin, for instance, white people were nearly 75% more likely than Black people to see all misdemeanor charges carrying a potential sentence of incarceration dropped, dismissed, or amended to lesser charges. Um, so COVID meant court closures, which meant more plea deals or trial dismissals, which meant that more Black people went to prison. So all three of the drivers of the prison population dropped during COVID. Decarceration policies, policing strategies, and court closures contain these signatures of racism and are indicative of uniform and deeply entrenched racial disparities in the criminal legal system. The changes we witnessed during COVID, of course, were already shaped by a history of white supremacy, racial discrimination, and, and, and inequality that the pandemic has magnified. There is a direct correlation and a history uh, behind the fact that the United States is home to the largest prison system in the world and is the place, one of the places with the highest number of coronaviruses, infections, and deaths in the world controlled for population. So the frequently cited statistic about incarceration in America that the US is 5% of the world population, but 25% of its world prisoners, as this graphic from the Prison Policy Initiative shows, is nearly analogous to the nation's share of all COVID deaths worldwide. So both its prison system and the number, so in both its prison system and the number of lives lost during the pandemic, the US, one of the most powerful and affluent nations in the world is an outlier. And this American exceptionism is a great exceptionalism is a grave reflection on the basic values of this country. Instead of spending more money on things like education and healthcare, a guaranteed income and full employment, policies allocate, policymakers allocate taxpayer dollars to police and prisons. Divesting from social welfare programs while ramping up investment into carceral programs over the past half century has left us underprepared to really confront the crisis of mass incarceration and the crisis of COVID-19, and we're reaping the consequences now. The COVID crisis has given us an opportunity to re-examine many of the fundamental problems in our society, mass incarceration, of course, being one of the foremost problems. Policing and prison systems are the engine of inequality in America. The alarming trend wrought by COVID that is an increase in the proportion of black prisoners who were uh, at a disadvantage through every change the system caused by the pandemic should force us to reevaluate how we lock people up and why we lock people up for as long as we do. Policing strategies and sentencing practices are inherently racist. They failed the COVID stress test and the entire system failed. In addition to releasing people as part of effective and ethical public health practice, we should use the pandemic as an opportunity to think about decarceration on a larger scale and change our sentencing structures in the future. These moves would join the larger conversation that emerged during the protests for racial justice in the summer of 2020 in response to the killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police. These racial justice protests constituted the largest social movement in US history and also, of course, cannot be separated from the pandemic. People were home and watched the nearly 10 minute video of George Floyd's tragic death and were moved to take action in a way that perhaps they would have not been in the before times. People were under lockdown for months and wanted to be with, in community with one another fighting for justice. 
And mass mobilization called on us to think about how we might realize a different set of investments in low income communities and communities of color in particular outside of policing and surveillance and incarceration. The controversial, the controversial slogan, defund the police, was a call to divest from prisons and police forces and instead invest in social supports, educational opportunities, job creation, guaranteed income, decent housing, basic things that federal, state, and local governments have failed to provide for our most vulnerable, vulnerable citizens. The virus, of course, exacerbated vulnerabilities in all of these areas. So now that the social, political, and economic viruses have been unmasked and the impact of COVID-19, especially in low-income communities of color and in prisons has been exposed, the task before us is ensuring that in the future, we can create a more equitable society with greater social supports so that the next time we're faced with a global pandemic, we're able to respond much more effectively and won't continue to spread the virus of racism that has infected American culture and institutions from the very beginning. Thank you. That was fantastic. <laughs> I was busy taking notes, so I apologize. It took me a minute to take that last note to come back on camera. Thank you Thanks so much, Dr. Time. Hinton. That was really, really just quite wonderful. And thank you for the specificity, particularly as you talked about, right, the ways in which decarceration has happened, where it hasn't happened, and particularly, of course, the the nature of even state by state and the kinds of policing and surveillance and violence that continues. So I'm gonna jump into a couple questions, but before I do that, let me just say this. Put your questions in the chat, everyone. Buy the books, buy all of her books, buy all the books and put your questions in the chat because we'll come to questions in just a few moments. Okay, now, uh, so let's go back to some of, the, some of what you were talking about here. And I want to, just go back to talk a little bit about when you think about prison populations, and we know that in many ways, right, they're throw, that's the throw, throw away population in a lot of ways, right? That's how people sort of uh, often imagine this prison population. And so as we, I want to go back to this uh, link that you're making, right, about sort of building and building equality. And you, uh, this is one of the last things you said, we can think about decarceration in these sentencing structures, right? And if we think about what happened with George Floyd, everybody was sort of mobilized, but was that a moment? And how do we think about building that from a moment to actually addressing some of the things that led to the murder of George Floyd, which is exactly what you've just talked about. So could you talk to us a little bit about how we build on that in terms of thinking about sustaining right, and really addressing these pernicious issues as they continue. Yeah, so part of it is that we have to keep organizing and we have to keep mobilizing. I think that's one of the things, to be honest, um, that's been kind of, for lack of a better word, disappointing, is that I feel like we we're at a new kind of level of conversation about many of these issues and like systemic racism, right, which is something that we've been talking about for decades became this buzzword and people were really interested in thinking about, well, what are the connections? Like how is, how is George Floyd tied to all of these larger systems of inequities in, in, um, in nutrition and in food security and housing, not just policing and in, in employment. Um, and so I think part of it is, um, you know, trying to continue to make these links for people so that these connections become more clear and are, and are undeniable and can provide a pathway in terms of the kinds of policy changes that we need to make. But it's also, you know, keeping um, the people mobilized and informed. And that's, that's the larger question because um, people aren't in the streets. I mean, of course, people are always in the streets, but they're not in the streets in the same way as they were in 2020. Um, you know, the, the issue of um, the, 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 what, what defund raise, which is, as, as I said at the end of the talk, is about, you know, bringing in a different set of investments. Um, you know, essentially, the, the 2020 protests were about you know, we we no longer support this form of governance, and COVID was it was underscored that you know the 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 way that we that the U.S. has invested in war and in the war war abroad and the war at home in terms of policing and, and incarceration hasn't worked. It doesn't keep us safe during pandemic. It doesn't. Um, it it makes certain populations really vulnerable um, to death. 
And that, you know, became very clear in 2020. That's what these protests were really about. And, and yet, um, you know, we have the president saying, turning that on, on its head and saying in the state of the union address, fund the police. Um, so I, I guess, you know, I don't know if I necessarily have the answer to that other than like, we need, you know, social movements are not about hashtags. It's about doing the work. It's about getting out there and organizing, working with people, being in the streets. And I think that's one of the kind of dangers that people think if they retweet something, or posting on Instagram that they're that they're doing activism and that's helping to spread awareness, but that's not putting the kind of pressure that we need to put on our policymakers to bring about the kind of society that's going to lead to the necessary, more equitable distribution of resources. You led right into my next question, which is really about this pressure, right? That you you definitely alluded to in your third point at the end. That's the one I was writing down at the last moment, right? It's about these support structures, right? And how do we reimagine the support structures, not just us who have always been reimagining the, the support structures, but how do we push that envelope, right? To put that pressure on lawmakers, to put that pressure on, um, pop, you know, the people who, are sort of in the, that conversation. So talk to us a little bit, because some of you talk about this, not just in this, but in some of your other work, right? What's the kind of work that needs to be done in thinking about making those connections to actually address those structural supports? Well, I'm thinking about what you said kind of in, in um, the opening of your comments, which is that people who are incarcerated are seen as throwaway people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of it. I think that, uh, that um, you know, with respect to COVID in prison, um, people who are incarcerated are other, othered, they're dehumanized. I mean, that's part of, you know, the, like that, the, the, the larger, um, socio cultural historical context that got them to prison in the first place. Um, so part of it is doing this larger work of, of actually helping raising awareness and helping the people realize that, um, you know, people who are incarcerated or, and people who are different from us, um, for that matter are also, people with feelings and families and sadnesses and happinesses, um, joy. And I think that there's so much division in US society that it's very difficult for people to see somebody who has been marked in a certain way as somebody with a um, conviction is, or see somebody who is different um, from you as a person. And so part of it is like raising awareness in that respect. I mean, thinking about um, the abolition, the movement, for the abolition of slavery, a big part of that um, in its early stage was to, in, in many ways, humanize um, enslaved people. Um, slave narratives, slave testimony, um, these stories about what, what the experience of enslavement actually was helped generate outcry. And I think you know, that those testimonies have led to increased awareness and concern about mass incarceration, but clearly we need to go um, even further. And, you know, the hierarchy too of the, um, of the mortality rates during COVID that I show also reflect the way that how race structures, you know, who is deserving, who is undeserving, whose lives matter and whose lives don't matter. I actually want to query, dig a little bit deeper there because exactly those graphs that you showed, particularly even as you talked about, right, that sort of decarceration process and then the growth, right? And I think this is where, as you even talk about a building awareness, I was so, the data project, right? Now, you know, I'm a data geek anyway, but the, the to, to collect that kind of data, right, will actually be super helpful because of what you talked about, the inaccurate information, right? So, so in thinking about that, as you think about this humanizing, right? Thinking about how we humanize, and I was glad even when you read the, read the letter, right? In terms of that storytelling, what do you see as part of those processes of humanizing the prison? And when I say this, not just humanizing the prison, the prisoner, but actually providing that information about the inhumanity of prisons, right? And so both of those narratives simultaneously, because I think part of what I hear you saying is, right, there is this, the, the narrative of the dehumanizing, right, that then allows for this, but there's also, right, the, the fact that of the way you talked about what's happening in these prisons that's inhumane. Well, I think, you know, part of it, and 
and this is definitely true for those of us who do work in this space, is that people who are in prison or have been to prison really need to be front and center in these conversations. Like it's really, you know, so much of this is a collaborative effort and it's going to take all of us from various, with various kinds of expertise coming together um, to be able to bring about change. So it's not, you know, all kinds of people and institutions got us into this mess. We're all somewhat complacent in it and it's going to take all of us to get out of it. And, you know, one of the big um, slogans among um, Just Leaders, which is one of the great organizations that's, um, that's, that's doing work in this space and that is um, started by formerly incarcerated people and most of the people um, involved are formerly incarcerated. The slogan is those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Many organizations in this space have similar slogans and that's true. Like the people who have experienced this know best, um, you know, Colton himself, I wish he was here, can tell you way better than I can. Um, but given how the, given the like the way that prison administrators do everything they can to cut people incarcerated who are incarcerated off from the rest of society, um, that's the only you know like that's that's what I have that's what I had to offer. So um, you know part of it is trying to when possible include um, as many different voices with different backgrounds and experiences, um, especially those who have who have. Um, been in the system firsthand to talk about what's going on. Um, and I think that even, even that part, again, you know, thinking about historically the process of um, slavery abolition, the abolition of slavery, it was very, very important for enslaved people to come out and tell um, and tell their stories. And I think that that's, that's, that's something that has begun to change in recent years, and I hope it will continue to. And then, you know, it's putting formerly incarcerated people and incarcerated people in real positions of power. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, you heard me say, and I'm sure you're, you're probably familiar with Nancy Frazier's work. So Nancy Frazier was here, and of course, talking about this important uh, relation to capital, right? And of course, you, of course, have, uh, uh, talked about this relationship to poverty and those who are impoverished and access to resources. And so one of the examples that you gave during your talk was this uh, uh, essential workers, defined as essential or not, but essential for our livelihood, right? Delivery workers, et cetera, who were disproportionately people of color and then and, and in this uh, facing this criminal system. So could you talk a little bit more because I think that as we think about the ways that I thought that was very interesting and important, right? As we think about the ways in which, even at the moment, that people are dependent upon, right? This, these delivery services, et cetera, racism still usurps that, right? Racism undergirds and usurps that. So you might not get your pizza because actually the, it's going to be stopped by the police, right? So could you talk a little bit about that dis that kind of disruption in terms of the systemic way that that, can, that, that, that that works, racism, surveillance, policing, and, right, upholds, right, those systems of capital? Well, I think, you know, I mean, the, the purpose of policing when it comes to low-income people and people of color is not to um, help people and not to protect property, but it's to, um, you know, find criminals or potential criminals, identify them, stop them, search them, arrest them, remove them from the community. Um, and that's been the kind of logic of policing in communities of color um, from emancipation on. Um, and so, you know, again, you know, just as, you know, I said, like the, you know, we, we prior to the pandemic, we had this moment where um, the prison system, it seems like, you know, was beginning to, the, 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 or, or the racial inequality in the prison system was narrowing. Um, you know, when the pandemic happened, and that's why I think the stress chest metaphor is so important, because by default, oh, then like, you know, it starts to black, uh, incarcerated black people and people of color begin to shoot up again. And I think that's enough, you know, like by default, when there is, when, when the, when the nation is in crisis, the default response is to criminalize um, people of color for the safety, right, of, of middle class um, and white people, and, and as an attempt to not um, disrupt uh, or to fall back on the old status quo or not disrupt the status quo. So I think that um, is a major, is a major, major part of it. Absolutely. Again, reminding you, drop your questions in. I have lots of questions. So, you know, we, as I said before, 
So let's now talk a little bit about, and let's, I want to go back to um, this, this notion of lockdown that you talked about and mm -hmm. punishment. And in particular, when you talked about, right, this, um, because I also think, I think a lot about the, the, the people, the, the hidden parts of our society, right? Mm -hmm. What's hidden. And so as you talked about this, right, the punishment was for lockdown, not safety. Yeah. Right. Right. And so talk, I mean, the lockdown was for punishment, not safety. I said that backwards, but you understand yeah. what I meant. Um, so could you talk to us a little bit more about who gets access to safety and who does mm. not, mm. right? In that relationship between punishment and safety? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, I mean, I, when I, when I, when I read that in Colton's email, you know, like what, I think when, with so much that, um, when it comes to criminal legal institutions and when you hear about abuses and when you hear about um, state sanctioned violence and killings, it's always surprising, not surprising. And, you know, like the, again, the default in prison um, is to um, punish people, is to keep people as disciplined as possible, is to put people on lockdown if, if it seems in any way that the institution is um, going into crisis. The default response, um, you know, of, of prison administrators is not to help people, is not to try to try to make conditions as humane as possible, but to actually make them inhumane to punish people. Um, in, in the California system, especially, you know, people are on lockdown when there's like a fight in the yard um, for months, which means that people can't visit them, which keeps them isolated, um, which again, you know, serves to, to keep the prison running according to, um, or, or in, in the image of the, um, of the powers that be. And so I think, you know, the, the question of like safety and who gets to be safe comes into all the things that we've talked about. I mean, I, I think so much of it, of course, has to do with, um, with, with class and with race. When you think about public safety in general, and we think about like, you know, what, what the way that I, actually define safety. It's like, you know, having, um, being able to have access to food, um, you know, like three meals a day, nutritious food, food that's not rotten, food that's good for you and fresh. I mean, that's, I think, part of safety. Health is part of safety. Um, happiness is part of safety. Have, you know, feeling like you're thriving and that you love what you do. Um, being able to parent your kids in the way that you want to. All of these things, I think, are part of safety and aren't usually how we define them. And of course, all of these things, um, those of us who have the financial resources have greater access to. Um, so safety is in many ways tied directly um, to class, which we know intersects very, very deeply with race. Yeah. And I, I know that you talk about this in your book. I know this isn't on this, but, yeah, I, yeah, but you talk about that idea of, 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 of white vigilantism, right? Mm -hmm. And how that gets played out in these spaces. And maybe you could just talk about that a little bit. So for those of you who haven't bought or read the book, this is a little teaser here. So talk to us a little bit about that connection related to what you talk about around, around white vigilantism. Well, you know, you, you know, so, okay. So this is, and this may be not be exactly what you were asking because this actually, I didn't talk about it in my book, but there's, you know, like the other, there's a white vigilante story in COVID of course too, right? I mean, it culminated in January 6th, but if, you know, if you look at, um, all of the lockdown protests and how violent they were. I mean, you think about like our militias going to um, the Michigan State Legislate, 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 uh, Legislative Building, the Capitol Building in Michigan with guns and with Confederate flags and military fatigues protesting um, Governor Gretchen, Gretchen, Gretchen Whitmer's restrictions that were intended to keep people safe that were about public health, um, that were completely ethical. And there were so many of these protests around the country. Um, it's the same people out there protesting restrictions, right? Who ended up voting for Trump, who protested the, uh, the election counts in various states and many of whom then um, stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Um, so, there, so I think by August, the number of, um, not the size, but the number of these um, lockdown related protests had exceeded um, the, the racial justice protests. 
in yeah. August. So yeah, um, and the reason I brought that up, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. That's a little different, but but I brought it up because we we can remember the 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 couple in the in the in their lawn with the guns, right? All of those things that were happening at that time, right? In this notion of safety and safety from whom and protection, and then actually who actually was committing and doing violence, which leads me to my next question, actually, which is about where you talked about recidivism, right? Mm -hmm. And this notion, right? And you actually had some data there that you talked a little bit about with um, one one person being sort of thought as, right, going to commit a crime and then actually the white uh, counterpart who does. Mm -hmm. So could you talk to us a little bit also about these intersections with recidivism? Um, and then, and, and I'll, I'll foreshadow my next question, which is really about those criteria for uh, release that you talked mm -hmm. about. I want to go back to that, okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so recidivism. Um, so the question, so just like, like, yeah, so just, so just tell us a little bit about, right, the ways in which, expand on the ways mm -hmm. in which racism, mm -hmm. but oh, yeah. also, but also, right, right this pr notion of protection, right, relates to this mm -hmm. idea of recidivism. So we know it's racism, but it's also about protection right. and safety. Right. Yeah. Well, so, so, so on the one level, you know, with like the risk, the algorithmic risk assessment tools, again, I mean, like, and, and let's just say in terms of safety and protection, I mean, historically, right, um, people of color and black people have been demonized and criminalized and seen and painted as dangerous. So automatically, like, you know, when the black person steps into the elevator and you grab the person of color and you grab your per, I mean, that's part of this, the way that um, race and, and degree of dangerousness has been infused. And these ideas, of course, seep into these racist um, algorithms. But the other part of it in terms of recidivism that is really important that I didn't get into in detail, which fits in some with the release criteria is that, you know, when you're coming from an under-resourced or poor background, it's you're less likely when you're being released from prison to have the kind of support, like to have an address to come home to, to have a family member whose couch you can sleep on, to have somebody who can drive you to a place to get a driver's license, which is a first step for many, or to fill out a job application. Um, again, all of these things are deeply, deeply tied to class. So the, the, the poorer you are in many ways, the less protected you are. Um, you know, on top of, again, like all of these, the stereotypes and the way that dangerousness and, um, and, and one's racial background is so linked in the um, American imagination. Um, yeah. But a lot of that safety, right, um, has to do with class and, and, your, and your community supports in the first place. Um, and the like, the, the, the biggest predictors of recidivism are education level and job level, which we know too um, are shaped by, you know, access to either are deeply, deeply shaped by historical inequality. So in a lot of ways, it's this long history, you know, this history that is still very much living and shaping our institutions and our interactions um, that's leading to these outcomes in the present. Absolutely. So let's go back to those, um, you know, those those criteria, and and pick up this point because you're obviously you talked about the assessment tools and the the. But I want to go to this. If I because the other thing that you talked about is right. Many of the people have been convicted on crimes that were part of the drug war, uh, drug, drug wars, etc. So now I was convicted when I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Now I'm 50 years old and you're asking me to, for an address to return to and someone, to, et cetera. So could you talk also about the sort of ways in which and connect those historical policies, right, that led to these long sentences that then ultimately when you get to the COVID stress test, you're going to fail the test because I, you don't, you didn't build it. Anyway, you'll talk more about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, I mean, this, and this is kind of like the bread and butter of a lot of, you know, like what I do, the way that um, policies, policing strategies and sentencing decisions targeted um, low income people of color in this country. And especially, I mean, you know, we begin to see three strikes laws um, and, and draconian sentencing practices in the 70s. But you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s with the war on drugs is when you know the the federal government um, begins 
mandatory minimum sentences for certain crimes. It's when you get the um, the sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine so that you know, a couple of packets, sugar packets worth of crack are sentenced um, as harshly as like three flour bags worth of powder cocaine. Um, and people were just getting locked up for um, drug possession. Now, you know, the war on drugs is not why the US is an outlier, um, but, these, but these kind of three strikes laws, mandatory minimum sentences reflect the, the deeply, um, and unnecessarily harsh um, way that the United States punishes. So, you know, I mentioned too that over the last decade, uh, the proportion of um, incarcerated Black people has been going down for the first time um, since the 1960s, right? But the problem in COVID is that all of these people who were arrested, as you said, Dr. Coleman, in their, you know, as young people, um, or, you know, got slapped with these like indeterminate sentences or really, really harsh sentences. Again, remember, you know, think like 90s super predator. Policymakers actually believed that 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 that, that groups of um, young uh, black and Latinx kids were like irredeemable, immoral and just needed to be locked up and throw away the key. So people who were in for relatively minor crimes and who might have also you know, um, uh, accrued um, criminal charges while in prison, um, you know, are old. They're not, they're very, very, I and mean, we do know that age does play into likelihood of committing a crime. They're not likely to commit another crime. And um, this aging population in American prison systems is also who, was, who were locked up, you know, at the height of this hysteria, um, are, are also extremely vulnerable to COVID. So it's almost like the ghosts of these horrible decisions that were made, um, many of them without any kind of basis in the 80s, the 70s, 80s, and 90s um, are now um, shaping outcomes and haunting our society today in, in yes. a way that before COVID we didn't quite see. Yeah. Um, and that's what you said about like, right, this is the, the sentencing was a death sentence, but that might have been 30 yeah. years ago, right? right. Because right. of the ways in which these systemic policies exactly. are built upon each other. That's a beautiful, I mean, it's, you know, it's disturbing, but like, that's a great way to really capture that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's your word. So I'm just, <laughs> so we have, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. And so I'm going to turn to a couple of those now. Now I have to read. So let me just uh, look here. Okay. So cities like New York or LA, and this is an anonymous question, cities like New York or LA seem to have a leadership that is poised to return to the broken windows sort of policing. Mayor, Mayor Adams, uh, for instance, just relaunched the NYPD's gun task force, a centerpiece of broken windows policing. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about this in general, and in particular, how, how might you draw the connection between what you've observed in prisons during COVID and what cities are doing now as they sort of reimagine, right, safety, thinking about unsheltered people, uh, the dismantling of the 50, 53 and 55 of the encampment camps last week. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. And, so and let's, let's broaden this, not just to New York, specifically in New York, but because you're, you're excellent at this, which you've already demonstrated, talk to us about some of the other cities that are happening and what the larger issues there too. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think, so this is, this is where um, the research, which I didn't talk about, you know, I didn't, I didn't actually, I realized like usually this talk probably has a less history than I, than I've given in a long time in a talk, <laughs> but in my two books um, together and, and, and really, you know, my first book um, was based on the White House central files of every presidential administration from Kennedy um, through Reagan. And both of these books, I think really <laughs> prove that the decision to respond to socioeconomic problems, that is like unemployment. So if I'm talking about through the talk, unemployment, um, failing public schools, um, deteriorating housing conditions or inhumane housing conditions, lack of health care all of these socioeconomic issues with policing and surveillance and incarceration, which is how um, policymakers at all levels of government have responded um, since the civil rights movement, we now know has failed um, 
as, as a policy path. It's, it's arguably one of the biggest domestic policy failures in US history, certainly of the 20th century. Um, and when you look at things like the, the so-called crime wave of 2020, it's not taken as evidence, hmm, this like our policing strategies actually don't work. They actually don't keep our most vulnerable community safe. Maybe we need to try something else. Um, you know, like these policies, broken windows, doesn't work. It hasn't worked. And we know it doesn't work. We know what does work. And we know what's much less expensive. That's early childhood education, Head Start programs, job programs, job creation programs, um, edu you know, investing into public schools and creating robust public schools. All of these things work to keep our community safer. Um, yet <laughs> they're not, that, that's not uh, the, how policymakers respond. You know, I mentioned, I think in the talk that Biden and the State of the Union said fund the police. Um, you know, like that's really, you know, like that's where we are. The return to broken windows in New York and other cities, um, you know, these, these zero tolerance policies failed them. They do not work to keep communities safe instead of actually looking at um, a spike in homicides and saying, okay, we've got to, let's try something radically new. It always, the default is always more police. And so, um, you know, I think with respect to what I was talking about, um, if we go back, you know, re-embracing the, the, this broken windows policing is, is going to ensure that the same kinds of disparities and inequalities that have pervaded the criminal legal system in the post-civil rights era um, will continue and may even worsen. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that, thank you. Um, so we have one more question here, which is about Ukraine. I mean, we are in the middle of a war and thinking about militarization and the police, et cetera. So could you just talk to us a little bit about the connections you might make between right militarization, war, what is happening and obviously uh, police violence and surveillance. Well, it's all so deeply connected, right? Because, you know, Johnson declares, Lyndon Johnson declares the war on crime, which, you know, begin, you know, which be modernizes American law enforcement, actually revolutionizes, let's call it what, what it is, American law enforcement and plants the seeds of incarceration in the context of the Vietnam War. And a big push in the early war on crime um, was to facilitate the transfer of surplus military technologies that were being used in Vietnam and US interventions in the Caribbean and Latin America to local police forces. So the, the continued war making abroad feeds into um, the war making at home. Um, and of course, these technology transfers had continued throughout the 20th century. A lot of people, you know, when we saw those armored tanks in Ferguson in 2014, people thought, oh, this is from the war on terror, but no, it goes back, right, to 65, to, um, to the height of the civil rights movement. So, um, you know, all of these things are, are very, very connected. And it's, again, connected to these priorities that, you know, instead of ensuring that people are safe and that people are healthy and that people have enough food to eat, um, you know, we're locking people up in prison, we're engaged in, in, in never-ending interventions outside of the U.S. Um, and we're back to broken windows. Well, this leads us to the next question, which is about health. How would you think about, right, redefining the health of the nation, right, as we think about these ideas of health and then the systems that are broken, particularly as we think about the unhealthy, I think, nature, that's not in this question, but the unhealthy nature of our prison system. So could you reflect for us a little bit on this idea of healthy systems, policy, et cetera? Well, I think we, we definitely need um, a different kind of system to, to deal with um, and heal from harms um, in our communities and harms that are committed by other people. I, again, like, um, you know, the, uh, the heavy handed policy towards um, criminals to, towards uh, crime and, all, and, and, um, and, and violence in general, you know, the, the, the way that the US incarcerates people and putting people in prisons doesn't work and it's inhumane um, and it has eroded our democracy. I mean, it prevents us from being um, a fully flourishing society. So, you know, I mean, I, I think 
we need, you know, we need to have a more equitable distribution of resources. Um, you know, we have never, the United States has never um, really, really sought to enact policies that are based on the principle of equality. You know, you, you, we saw glimmers um, during the Civil War, we saw glimmers um, during the Civil Rights Movement, but in both of those cases, uh, you know, you get that the, 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 the kind of lasting legacy becomes um, new criminal laws targeting people of color, Black people, in particular in both cases, and a, um, a mini mass incarceration with, um, in the in the um, immediate post-Civil War period, it was convict leasing, and um, in the post-Civil Rights period, it's the beginnings of mass incarceration. So, um, you know, I think that we, we need to um, relate to one another from a place of love and care, which I think COVID has shown the ways that we do in a lot of ways, but also the ways that we don't. Um, and in that creating and supporting policies that will allow us to create vital communities and to fully flourish as human beings. And the way, you know, the, the, the US system of punishment um, does neither, it dehumanizes people and it also doesn't <laughs> make us safe. Um, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't make us safer. Um, and in many respects turns, um, is criminogenic in itself. So, you know, part of it in thinking about safety um, and thinking about equality is, is um, devising a system that's based on principles of restoration and repair instead of retribution. Um, and that, you know, like everything I've been talking about, right? It's like, it sounds pie in the sky. I mean, it takes, it's gonna, it's gonna take a major shift um, in our worldview. And it's something that, you know, likely, or maybe, you know, we can hope won't happen um, or fully happen during my lifetime, but I hope that it might happen in my children's lifetime or my grandchildren's lifetime. And that's why I do this work. And that multi multi sector multi uh, uh, sector approach that you're talking about, right? It took all of us to get in here, so it's going to take all of us to get out. I think that's really, really important. You know, I want to. We only have a few minutes left here, about eight minutes. So I'm going to um, ask you a couple of final questions. And you know, we have a lot of students, right? I mean, that's what we do. So it's our students, and so. Talk to us a little bit as you think about this emerging generation, right? We've seen a lot with this emerging gener these emerging generations in terms of movements, social movements, et cetera. We've also seen some of these, these generations treated poorly as a result of that, right? And um, so talk to us a little bit about students. Right, where you see that energy, that activism, the advocacy. I know you're, you know, you're at Yale, you've got your your own students, and I'm sure outside of that. So talk to us a little bit about that work and thinking about how they can work to address these issues. Because I think, like you said, pie in the sky for some of our students, and they get, you know, wrapped up into, well, if I can't change the world, then what am I supposed to do? So so, you know, I, I, um, my students give me, I mean, this might sound cheesy, but my students give me a lot of hope and inspiration and I'm counting on them, you know, because I already see it. Um, yeah. I'm counting on them to help bring about this shift. I mean, I think that a lot of students, especially at, um, elite universities like NYU and like Yale, um, and by the way, NY, I'm a very, I'm a very, very proud NYU, um, alum. <laughs> I, went to Gallatin. I should have mentioned that. All right. <laughs> went to Gallatin. I uh, love NYU. Um, love it, love it, love it. Really good. Um, but yeah, so so I, I wish, yeah, so so I I I feel I feel um positive about that. I mean, I think and it, and it really was the young people that um sustained the protest movement, but the thing, but the question is then like, how do you keep people organized and mobilized? And, well, that's and my next question is about the older folks like me. Yeah. So my first was about that. You, yeah. Now you could just go to us. What, what should okay. we be? Doing? Well, I'm still, I'm still, let, 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 let me say this one thing about yeah, this. Yeah, no, of course. And I think, I think that's part of the reason why um, history is so important. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to teach, I'm teaching right now the second half of the African-American history survey from emancipation in the present. And I'm, and I've tried to kind of flag um, you know, like actually, how do you build a social movement? Like, how do you organize? How did the Montgomery bus boycott actually happen? Right. And, and it, it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's yes. not leaders. It's yeah. actually like people and 
you know, when it comes to the black freedom struggle, black women um, holding it down, doing this kind of thankless work that you don't, you know, that's not like doing the press conference and leading, leading the thing. Um, but that's actually what it takes to build a movement and that it takes patience and time and that you, and that such a big part of it is building in community. And so I think, you know, again, this is where we are. I think there, are, there are really exciting possibilities that technology and social media presents to us. But I also think that there's a way that, so it, it opens up new possibilities for building communities, but it also, um, you know, might hamper that community building because you lose something um, when you're not in person with somebody or you lose something when you're just like hashtagging or retweeting <laughs> a slogan rather than like out there passing out flyers, right? Maybe you reach more people with the retweet, but the flyers, it's different. Um, I was really, I you know, it's, it's been interesting to teach in the past um, 10 years or so, you know, with from to see the generations of students from like the Obama students to the students, the Trump students, the, the students I, the, that the class of 2020 who came in, started mm -hmm. college and Trump is elected and then leave with COVID. I mean, they're gonna, wow. that's gonna wow. be, um, I think that the, 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 like the bookend of, of a college experience like that really shapes your view of the world and also shapes what might be possible for American institutions. I was talking, I'm teaching a seminar. I know I'm like yapping on, but I'll wrap no, it up. No, it's great. <laughs> okay. I'm teaching a seminar right now called the war, the wars on crime and drugs. And, you know, we were talking um, last week about, you know, like, what's it going to take to this question? You know, what's it going to take? And I was, I was really shocked because the students were like, it's going to, it's going to take a revolution, which I, I hadn't heard from the students for a while because yeah. they were not talking about revolution in, you know, maybe a little bit in, in Obama's administration, but I hadn't heard students say, yeah, you know, it's going to be, that, that, that's the only way we're going to change things. That's the only way it's worked historically. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, you know, to me, it, to, for them to say that, um, you know, makes, it makes me feel as though they are anticipating, you know, let's hope not a bloody revolution, but they're anticipating major, major changes and they seem prepared and dedicated to, um, to fighting to, to bring about the, the kind of society that they want to live in. And I think 2020 was hopefully just the opening act of that. That's terrific. Yeah, and so um, I guess we'll end with this question, which is a question we always like to end with with our talks, which is, you know, so many of our students and some of the people on this are, we're, and you, we're working really hard. We're, we're doing a lot of work. We're trying to make, you know, substantive change. So what brings you joy and how do you take care of yourself? Because for our students out there, they have to, you know, they have to sustain themselves. They have to take care of themselves. They have to figure out how to do it and, and manage. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay. So I'll say, I'll say, uh, I'll say two things. Okay. Um, so the, okay. So the first is, um, you know, at this point, so I, I'm, I'm a newish mom. I have a two and a half year old and a nine month old and my kids, you know, that's like, it's become about, and especially, you know, my, my daughter was eight months um, when lockdown hit and she just became like my, um, you know, our family's source of joy during COVID because even as, you know, we were in lockdown, we didn't know what was going to happen. Everything was just kind of up in the air. She was continuing to grow. She mm -hmm. was continuing to make us smile. Um, so, so much of it um, is my kids. The other, so the other thing, like for students, the real thing, I think this, like, I don't know. I don't know how much I've talked about this publicly before, but you know, I'm thinking about all of this like maddening stuff, angering stuff, these big questions all the time. And so the only way that I can like get my mind to totally stop is um, junk TV. <laughs> Let me tell you, I haven't really. It's been a really busy. This semester has been really busy, and I like not sleeping that much, working a lot. But I think tonight after this, I might, especially after this conversation, I might have to go watch an episode of season two of Bridgerton. <laughs> Nada. So. <laughs> I love it. You heard it here. You can have that release. You can do really, really, really incredibly important work. 
changing analyses of history and still watch a little Bridgerton. I yeah. love it. I love it because we do need those moments of we relaxation, do. et cetera. So thank you. And thank you for sharing. Thank you for being with us here tonight. For those of you who don't know this, uh, uh, Dr. Hinton has been here before, but we are very excited and we will invite you back again. Please, in person. Uh, yes, exactly, exactly. Please, of course, as I said before, check out her work, check out her uh, upcoming article that she mentioned, particularly as this new data come out. I'm very excited to read that myself. Thanks. Thank you to all of you for being here tonight, for being with us, for participating in this conversation. Uh, we know that, as I said earlier, right, this COVID pandemic continues with disparate impacts across our globe. So please, um, of course, build awareness, pay attention, and work together in community. As Dr. Hinton has said, it's going to take all of us across sectors, across areas, across generations, etc., to do this important work. We hope that you will continue to, of course, visit the Skirball website and look at uh, amazing programs, both at the end of this semester and coming up in the fall. And please join us for our Office of Global Inclusion final events as we wrap up this semester. Thank you again to Dr. Hinton for this incredible conversation. And of course, thank you for all of your incredible work, most importantly. Please take good care out there. Remember, put your oxygen mask on first before you can take care of others because we have to do that. Be well, everyone. Thank you and have a good night.